The most sinister and disturbing crimes bloom from moments so mundane that they're barely noticeable. A spontaneous break in a long-held routine, a friendly smile to a stranger, a spur-of-the-moment decision on a warm evening to take the long way home. Those are the points where the splinters of tragedy begin to pierce an otherwise peaceful existence. That's how it was in the case of Julia Wallace. Found brutally battered to death in the sitting room of her home in Liverpool, on the evening of the 20th of January, 1931. A crime seemingly without a motive or a solution, it has haunted the imaginations of crime writers ever since. Dorothy L. Sayers, Marjorie Allingham, P.D. James, they all spent time submerged in the overlapping and contradictory mysteries of this one 48-hour period in 1930s Liverpool, baffled as to how this real-life case could be stranger than any fiction. And it all started with a telephone call. Welcome to She Done It. I'm Caroline Crampton. I want to remind listeners that this is a very research-intensive and completely independent podcast. If you enjoy listening to it and feel able to support what I do, the best way is to become a member of the She Done It book club, where in return for your contribution, you get to hear the show without advertising, listen to extended versions of interviews, and join the community in reading and discussing a different Golden Age murder mystery every month. Find out more and sign up by visiting shedoneitbookclub.com slash join, or by clicking the link in the description of this episode. The telephone call was for William Herbert Wallace, Julia's husband. On Monday the 19th of January 1931, the day before her death, William set out as usual from their home on Wolverton Street in Anfield, a neighbourhood that lies to the north and east of Liverpool city centre, to go to his weekly chess night. The Liverpool Central Chess Club met at the city cafe, and William had entered his name in advance for the tournament that was to be played that evening. He left home as usual about 7.15, expecting to arrive in time to start playing around 7.45. At 7.20, the telephone at the cafe rang. A waitress answered, and upon learning that the caller wanted to speak to a member of the chess club, she called over the club's secretary, Sam Beatty, to deal with it. In evidence later, Sam said that the caller was someone with a strong, rather gruff voice, and that they asked for William Herbert Wallace. They were disappointed to learn that he hadn't arrived yet for the meeting, because they had hoped to catch him to make a business appointment. The caller also mentioned that their daughter was about to turn 21, which was relevant because William worked in insurance, and it was customary at the time to give someone coming of age an endowment policy as a gift, since it would pay them out a lump sum at a later date. Sam inferred, therefore, that this call could lead to a nice bit of extra work for his fellow chess enthusiast, and therefore suggested that the caller ring back a bit later in the evening when William would have arrived for the club meeting. Strangely, the caller declined, preferring to leave a message for Sam to pass on. The substance of this was that Wallace should come to 25 Men Love Gardens East in Mossley Hill at 7.30pm the next day in order to meet the caller, who gave the name of R.M. Qualtro before ringing off. Sam Beatty's later evidence suggested that in the moment he just thought this caller was a business acquaintance of William Wallace's, He passed on the message in that spirit when Wallace did arrive to play chess about 15 minutes later. William hadn't heard the name, nor did he know where the address was, but he wrote it down anyway, and even apparently consulted some of the other members about the best way of getting to Men Love Gardens East. They decided that his best bet was to take the tram out towards Men Love Avenue, which is a major road running southeast from the city centre, and then explore to see if he could find the precise street there. William Wallace played chess for about two hours that evening, eventually winning his game, and then set off home. There was nothing, yet, to suggest that anything strange was afoot. To understand why the case has bewitched so many over the decades, I think it's necessary to introduce the key characters properly. Julia and William Wallace had been married for 18 years, They had met in 1911 in Harrogate in Yorkshire and got married on the 24th of March 1913. 
He had been working as a political agent for the Liberal Party. But when the First World War started, all political activity was suspended, so he instead got a job as a clerk in the Liverpool office of the Prudential Assurance Company. The couple moved to the city and settled down at No. 29 Wolverton Street. As far as any of their neighbours, colleagues and friends were able to say after the tragedy, they were happy. William described their relationship as very close. Neither of us cared very much for entertaining other people or for being entertained. We were sufficient in ourselves, he wrote. The Wallaces had no children and plenty of hobbies. Julia played the piano and painted, while William dabbled in amateur chemistry and enjoyed reading about philosophy as well as playing chess. They had lived in the same house for 16 years and seemed to have been very settled in their habits. Of course, nobody can ever really know what goes on behind closed doors or inside someone else's marriage, but all of the evidence presented at the time and uncovered since suggests that they were a financially comfortable, devoted middle-class couple. The unexplained violence of Julia's death that night in 1931 becomes all the more horrific when contrasted with her life beforehand. Now, let's run through the facts as it is possible to verify them. On Julia's last day, the 20th of January, everything seemed to be as usual. A policeman saw her husband William mid-afternoon, not far from the Anfield area, wearing a tweed suit and a light raincoat, and was able to confirm that this insurance clerk seemed to be going about his business in the normal way. Several insurance customers gave evidence that he had visited them to collect their payments that afternoon, and seemed in good spirits cracking jokes and accepting a cup of tea at one house. He finished work about six and popped home to join Julia for his tea, in anticipation of going out again to keep his 7.30 appointment with the person who'd called the chess club the night before, R. M. Qualtro of Men Love Gardens East. The last person to see Julia Wallace alive was a 14-year-old milk delivery boy who dropped off the evening pint sometime between 6.30 and 6.45 and said that he spoke to her as she fetched it in. The exact time was hard to fix after the fact, because there were contradictory statements about how long his milk round had taken. Julia could still have been alive as late as 6.45, as the evidence of a 16-year-old newspaper delivery girl nearby suggested. As you'll see later, this is the crucial window where the murder seems to have taken place, and one of the inconsistencies that drew Dorothy L. Sayers to the case. The next time that it's possible to be sure of William Wallace's movements is ten past seven, when he was at the tram junction on Smithdown Road, three miles away from his house, asking a conductor the best tram to take to Menlove Gardens East. Wallace asked several different tram conductors for help in finding Menlove Gardens East as he travelled through the city, repeating that he was a stranger to this part of Liverpool. He was directed to get off where a small street called Menlove Gardens West intersects with the larger thoroughfare of Menlove Avenue, which he seems to have done. This is where that telephone call the evening before starts to seem more sinister than mundane, because Wallace couldn't find the caller's address. He ran into a clerk called Sidney Herbert Green near the tram stop and asked for help, and was told that while there was a Menlove Gardens North, South and West, There was no Menlove Gardens East. These three streets make a triangle, not a square, around a small park. Wallace tried knocking on the door of number 25 Menlove Gardens West, but was told by the woman who answered the door that no R. M. Qualtro lived there. By 7.45, Wallace had wandered further south to a road called Green Lane, where he met a policeman and asked for the address he was seeking, only to be told again that it didn't exist. He explained why he was hunting for it, and the constable suggested he look it up in the directory at a local newsagent's. And that's what Wallace did next. He spent about ten minutes hunting through a directory in a nearby shop, but still had no luck. Eventually, he gave up the search about 8.20, and set off home again from the nearest tram stop. About 8.45, the Wallace's neighbours, the Johnsons, reported hearing someone knocking on the back door of the next house. They were on their way out anyway, and as they left, they found Wallace trying to get into his own house. He explained that both the front and back doors seemed to be locked against him, 
even though his wife had a cold and he didn't think she would have gone out. The neighbour offered to get his own back door key and try that. They were terraced houses and presumably the theory was that the doors would be similar. Wallace explained that the back door lock was quite sticky and he did eventually manage to get it open while his neighbours were standing there talking to him. William Wallace was inside the house for about a minute and a half. Then he came running out and said, Come and see, she has been killed. Mr and Mrs Johnson later gave evidence that they'd come through with William into the front sitting room and there found Julia lying dead upon the floor, her head bashed in and blood splashed everywhere. Crumpled up underneath her body was a Macintosh that William later identified as his own. He had been wearing it that afternoon, but had changed into a thicker overcoat before going out to keep the bogus appointment at Men Love Gardens East. Mr Johnson went out to fetch a policeman, and while Wallace waited with Mrs Johnson, he sobbed a couple of times, but mostly kept control of himself, she reported. Once the police arrived, everything proceeded as you might expect. A search was made of the house, the Macintosh under the body was identified, and everyone present when the body was discovered was asked to account for their movements. William Wallace explained about the mysterious telephone call that had sent him on a wild goose chase to the other side of the city. A medical examination of the body around 10pm found that Julia Wallace had been dead not more than four hours, which fits in with the milk delivery boy's evidence of having last seen her alive about 6.30. No weapon could be found. Indeed, no weapon was ever found. But the Wallace's weekly cleaning lady did give evidence that the kitchen poker and an iron bar kept in the sitting room for cleaning under the gas fire had both gone missing since her last visit to the house. There was blood splashed over half of the sitting room and all over the Macintosh under the body. But no stains were discovered elsewhere in the house nor was there any evidence that anyone had cleaned themselves there recently, no wet towels or anything like that. William Wallace's mental state and his expression of emotion that evening became a very important part of the case. As I've already said, his neighbour Mrs Johnson later testified that he seemed upset but in control, but she was the only one to think that. Professor McFall, the doctor who examined the body that night, later said that he felt that William was far too composed given the shock he'd just experienced. He was too quiet, too collected for a person whose wife had been killed in that way that he described, McFall said later. Why, he was not so affected as I was myself. Wallace's explanation for this, by the way, is amazing. He responded to the assertion that he was stiff and emotionless in the face of his wife's death, by revealing that he was merely a disciple of the Stoic philosopher Marcus Aurelius. Wallace was quoted as saying, For forty years I had drilled myself in iron control and prided myself on never displaying an emotion outwardly in public. I trained myself to be a Stoic. After the initial police investigation, William Wallace the Stoic was allowed to spend the rest of the night at his sister-in-law's house nearby. He spent the whole of the next day being questioned again, spending nearly 12 hours at the station. The officers went into everything in great detail, including the whole story of that telephone call to the chess club the night before. And from the start of the investigation, they seemed to have a clear theory in mind. The case was already attracting a lot of press attention because of the violence of the attack on a completely respectable middle-class housewife. Ten days later, on the 2nd of February, the whole world found out who the police thought was responsible when William Wallace was arrested for the murder of his wife. And there'll be more on that after the break. Dorothy L. Sayers always maintained a lively interest in real-life murder cases, alongside her detective fiction. As I covered on the Nurse Daniels episode of this podcast, In 1927, Sayers and her journalist husband had even gone to France to try their hand at investigating a case for themselves. Her 1930 novel, The Documents in the Case, also draws inspiration from another real-life mystery I've covered on the show, the case of Edith Thompson and Frederick Bywaters, who were executed in 1923 for the murder of Edith's husband Percy. In addition, Sayers was one of the contributors to The Scoop, a collaborative radio serial that was aired in 1931, and written by members of the Detection Club. That story, too, was based on an actual murder case, the so-called Crumbles Murders. 
from 1924. All of which is to say, Sayers was no stranger to the interplay of fact and fiction when it came to murder and crime writing. When the Detection Club decided to put together a volume of essays by members about real-life cases, she volunteered to write about the murder of Julia Wallace in Liverpool in 1931. This was a case, she wrote, that could only have been put together by the perverted ingenuity of a detective novelist. The whole book, by the way, was called The Anatomy of Murder, and it was published in 1936. In her essay, Sayers lays out why this case, above all others, held such fascination for her. It provides for the detective novelist an unrivaled field for speculation, she wrote. Everything that happened between William Wallace leaving home to go to his chess club meeting on the Monday evening and returning from his wild goose chase on the Tuesday night to find his wife murdered is susceptible of at least two interpretations, she said. It's the crime writer's dream. All the clues can be twisted to fit one of several different solutions according to who you want to think committed the crime. When William Wallace was put on trial for the murder of his wife in March 1931, the level of interest in the case was so high that the legal establishment was concerned that he wouldn't get a fair hearing. When summing up the case to the jury, the judge therefore heavily emphasised the need to come to a verdict that fit the evidence presented and no other. Can you say, taking all this evidence as a whole, that you are satisfied beyond reasonable doubt that it was the hand of the prisoner and no other hand that murdered this woman, he said. It was not the job of the jury, in other words, to solve the case. They just had to decide whether the prosecution's case against William Wallace was strong enough to find him guilty beyond reasonable doubt or not. Sayers, however, sees a different role for herself. She isn't a juror, but a detective novelist. Therefore, it's her job, she says, to ask if the prisoner didn't do it, then who did? Let's take a closer look at the case the police had built up against William Wallace. Their theory right from the start was that he had committed a premeditated and calculated attack upon his wife. In this version of events, he had made that pivotal telephone call to himself in order to establish a plausible reason to be out of the house at the time when the crime was committed. As avid readers of detective fiction from this period will know, it was not usually possible to trace a call from a public telephone box after the fact. But in this case, the police got lucky. There happened to be a fault on the local telephone exchange at the time, so as part of the repair work, the staff were manually logging the origin point of every call. As such, there was a record of the call to the chess club at the City Café on the Monday evening and it showed that it had been placed from a public telephone kiosk about 400 yards from the Wallaces' home. The idea was then that William Wallace had left home to go to the chess meeting and made the call on the way, disguising his voice sufficiently so that whichever of his friends there answered would not recognise it as him. Having left the fake message that would take him out of the house on Tuesday night, William then proceeded into town as normal and arrived about 20 minutes after his own phone call. Then the next day he went home for tea after work and killed his wife with the poker shortly after 6.30, before going out to make sure he was seen by plenty of people on the other side of the city looking for an address that didn't exist, so that when the doctor gave an approximate time of death of around 7pm, he could show that he was already out. And then when he came back, he banged loudly on the already open door of his house to attract his neighbour's attention and then used them as witnesses to him finding the body of his wife for the first time. In a way, it was fortunate for William Wallace that the police suspected him so strongly from the beginning, because it meant that they paid a lot of attention to whether there was any blood on his clothes or body. He was searched very thoroughly, and not a single speck was discovered on him, which, given the amount of blood all over the sitting room, was a substantial point against him having committed the crime. This is where the Macintosh that was found under the body comes in, though. The police suggested that William had told Julia to set up the sitting room for one of their regular music evenings. He played the violin and she piano. And he'd gone upstairs to take off all his clothes and put on the Macintosh over his naked body. Then he crept up on his wife while she was bent over lighting the gas fire and killed her with the iron bar, having previously removed that to be handy for his use. The blood would have spattered all over the Macintosh, but he removed that and stuffed it under her body before cleaning himself redressing in the clothes he'd left upstairs, 
putting on his overcoat and going out. He carried away the weapon with him and disposed of it on the way to the tram in such a way that it was never found. Although it probably sounds a bit like something that a novelist would make up, the do a murder naked to avoid bloodstains on your clothes method had actually been used before. It had been employed in a couple of high-profile 19th century murders. In 1840, the MP Lord William Russell was murdered at his London home by his valet Francois Courvoisier, who apparently whispered to the executioner on the scaffold that he had committed his crimes in the nude to avoid bloodstains that would lead the police to suspect him. And again in 1892, the American Lizzie Borden was thought to have killed her father and stepmother while naked for the same reason. Before the arrival of more advanced forensic techniques, this was just about plausible. So that's how the prosecution explained their choice of William Wallace as the murderer in this case. It just about works as a theory, but there's very little evidence that actually confirms it. The weapon was never found, there were no corroborating fingerprints or bloodstains, and there were no witnesses to prove the jiggery-pokery with the telephone call. That's why the judge tried to direct the jury to be cautious in his summing up, but they still quickly returned a guilty verdict. William Wallace was sentenced to death. But that isn't the end of William Herbert Wallace's story, as it is with so many of these cases that I cover on the podcast. He was very lucky in his employer, shall we say. Before he stood trial, when public opinion in Liverpool had already decided that he must be guilty, his solicitor travelled in secret to London, to consult the executive council of the Prudential Staff Union. William and Julia had been fairly well off, but there was no way he could afford to pay for the hefty defence he was going to need, let alone any appeals afterwards. So his solicitor put it to the union that they should help him with these costs. And the union did something very strange. So strange, in fact, that another detective novelist, Marjorie Allingham, was moved to write an essay about just this aspect of the case, although it remained unpublished during her lifetime and has only recently been brought to light by the Crime Writers Association. In The Compassionate Machine, Allingham looks at the mock trial that the Prudential Staff Union Council conducted in absolute secrecy. Perhaps this is the kind of behaviour we should expect from people who assess risk for a living. They essentially put their colleague on trial for themselves so they could work out whether he was likely to be found guilty or not and therefore whether he would actually benefit from their assistance. Allingham remarks that this is a rare example of the machine of the law being put to compassionate use. In the mock trial, then, William Wallace was found not guilty, and so the union funded his defence. And then when the jury found him guilty, they funded his appeal. On the 19th of May, almost four months to the day after Julia had been killed, the Court of Criminal Appeal overturned the guilty verdict on the grounds that it was not supported by the weight of the evidence. This was actually the first time in British legal history that a conviction for murder had been overturned on these grounds. Usually, appeals succeed when there has been some prejudice from the judge, or because new evidence has come to light. But here, the court was essentially saying that the jury had got it wrong. The Prudential Assurance Company gave William Wallace his job back after the appeal and he tried to return to some semblance of normal life. But to the people of Liverpool, he was still a murderer, no matter what the court down in London had said. And it became impossible for him to stay in the city. He moved to a small cottage on the Wirral, on the other side of the River Mersey to Liverpool, and lived there quietly. Just under two years later, on the 26th of February 1933, he died of kidney disease in hospital. In Dorothy L. Sayers' 1937 novel Busman's Honeymoon, her sleuth Lord Peter repeatedly asserts that in solving a crime, motive matters far less than method in determining who the culprit is. When you know how, you know who, he says, over and over again. And that was definitely the maxim followed by the police in the Wallace case. They made very little effort to suggest what William's motive was for murdering his wife of 18 years, and instead focused only on how he might have done it. But in her account of the case, Sayers exercises her right as a detective novelist 
to stray beyond the limits of what a mere detective can do, and looked more deeply at the psychology of the characters involved. Nobody came forward to attest to any conflict or grievance between Julia and William Wallace, nor was there any suggestion of extramarital affairs or an end to their relationship. Unsurprisingly, given her husband's profession, Julia's life had been insured for £20, but that was a relatively small amount compared to the £90 she had in her savings account and the £152 that William had in his. He had no financial difficulties or secret debts that would make it worth him committing murder for such a sum. As Marjorie Allingham put it, Wallace stood to gain nothing but loneliness from his wife's death. Sayers was also dissatisfied with the police explanation for the timeline. The window between Wallace supposedly committing the murder and being on the tram to Men Love Gardens was just too narrow, she felt. Even if you take the earlier estimate of the last Julia sighting being 6.30, Wallace only had about 20 minutes to kill her, completely clean and redress himself, and then be on the tram in time. And again, no bloodstains were found in the bathroom, or indeed anywhere else in the house. So if this is how it happened, he did a very quick but thorough job, and it would have been a close-run thing. And then there was the telephone call, which made clear that the murder was premeditated. This couldn't be an argument turned violent or a chance attack, because someone had tried to mess around creating alibis 24 hours beforehand. This led Sayers to the conclusion that William Wallace was either an innocent man caught in a trap or a guilty man pretending to have been caught in a trap. There are a couple of aspects that point towards it being the former rather than the latter and suggest that the point of the telephone call was to set up William Wallace for a crime he didn't commit. Firstly, he was a regular attendee at the Tress Club, which always met on Monday evenings and started about 7.45, so anyone who'd been observing his habits could easily have gleaned this. Then on that particular evening, he had registered to take part in a tournament and the list of participants was advertised on the notice board of the cafe. So his attendance that night could also have been confirmed in advance. The club secretary who took the message said that it would be a great stretch of imagination to suggest that the caller had sounded like Wallace too. Sayers takes this further, suggesting that if indeed the call did come from a murderer who was trying to set things up to frame Wallace, they could well have been someone he knew since in setting this trap, they went out of their way to make sure that they had no direct contact with him. They could have called while he was there, or sent a note, but they chose to time the message so that it would be passed on by a third party, suggesting that their voice or handwriting would have been recognisable to him. There's no way to prove that, of course, but it's a smart deduction on her part. Sayers was far from the last person to delve deeply into the murder of Julia Wallace. Writers, lawyers and doctors alike have been fascinated by it for decades. And there have been plenty of further investigations and mock trials trying to determine what really happened. Several amateur sleuths over the years have identified Richard Gordon Parry, a junior colleague of William Wallace's at the insurance company, as being a more likely suspect. The theory runs thusly. William had discovered that Parry was stealing from their employer and was considering turning him in. Therefore, Parry makes the bogus telephone call and then either he or an unknown accomplice kills Julia in a way that they think will result in William going to prison or at the very least being completely discredited and fired. It's a more plausible motive, even if there's virtually no practical evidence to back it up. Another, less dramatic version suggests that Parry decoyed William away so that he could break in and steal the money that his colleague had been collecting from insurance clients that day, and that the murder was the result of Julia interrupting the burglary. But then that doesn't really account for the Macintosh or the fact that no money was missing. You begin to see what Sayers meant when she said that every incident was open to multiple interpretations. Several novelists incorporated elements of the case into their plots. Winifred Duke published a thinly veiled account of the case as Skin for Skin in 1935, a novel that Sayers reviewed very positively. John Rode returned to it twice, firstly in the brilliantly titled novel Vegetable Duck from 1944, and then again more explicitly in The Telephone Call from 1949. Then there are plenty of other detective stories where the fortuitous telephone call and the false appointment play a major role, such as Agatha Christie's radio play Personal Call, 
and the Sayers short story absolutely elsewhere. In that last one, Inspector Parker has a line which I think sums up the perennial appeal of this as a fictional device. So you see, he says, all the obvious suspects were elsewhere at the time. As the instrument that can make that so, the telephone was as powerful a weapon for the detective novelist as any blunt instrument. Interest in the murder of Julia Wallace has never dimmed. In 2013, P.D. James wrote an article for the Sunday Times in which he claimed to have solved the case at last. Her theory was that William Wallace was guilty, and it was only because his colleague Richard Gordon Parry had coincidentally chosen the same night for a prank phone call that the matter had become so muddled. Whether or not you find that to be a likely explanation, It was certainly proof of James's own decades-long obsession with this case. She included elements of it in her 1982 novel, The Skull Beneath the Skin, and then also in 2003's The Murder Room. For me, as for so many others who have poured over the facts of this case, it all comes back to that telephone call. The undeniable fact that somebody lured William Wallace out of the house the night that his wife was murdered makes it very unlikely that the attack on Julia was random or spontaneous. Somebody planned it. It forces William Wallace into one of two roles. As Sayers puts it, if guilty, he was the classic contriver and alibi monger that adorns the pages of a thousand mystery novels. And if he was innocent, then the real murderer was still more typically the classic villain of fiction. Either way, he was a character straight out of a murder mystery. This episode of She Done It was written and narrated by me, Caroline Crampton. You can find out more about the podcast and everything it covers at shedoneitshow.com, where there are also transcripts of every episode. She Done It is edited by Ewan McAleese. Production assistance from Leandra Griffith. Member support for the She Done It book club from Connor McLaughlin. Thanks for listening. I'll be back soon with a new episode. Mm-hmm.